How many straight lines make a circle? One? Well, sure, if you bend it, but that's cheating. Infinitely many? Sure, but I don't suppose anyone would want to draw that many lines. To clarify, I mean to ask, how many sides must a regular polygon have to be a circle? Obviously, the true answer is infinitely many, but again, who has the time for that? So instead, let's get very close. So close that for all intents and purposes, there is no difference. Right, so let's start with the opposite of a circle, a square. A square is like a circle, except that it only has four sides and they all meet their right angles. So you could think of a square as the best approximation of a circle with only four straight lines. Similarly, a pentagon is the best approximation of a circle you can get with five straight lines of equal size. But back to a square. The area of this four-sided regular polygon is A squared, where A is the length of one and thus all of its sides. That formula is fine and dandy, but it's not true for a three-sided polygon nor a five-sided polygon. This property is unique to a square and certainly is not true of our circle. Another way we can view this area is if we divide our square into four isosceles triangles. We can use the sine rule by stating the area of a triangle is equal to half AB sine theta, where theta in our case is equal to 90 degrees, or pi over two radians if you're feeling mathematical. A equals B in this case, and this represents not the length, but the distance from the vertex to the center, or in other words, the radius of our square, which we'll appropriately call R. Using some Pythagoras, we get r equals root 2 over 2a, so the area for one of these triangles is a half r squared sine pi over 2. Hence, the area of the square is equal to 4 times this amount. That works out to be 2r squared, but since r equals root 2 over 2a, r squared equals 1 half a squared, which when multiplied by the 2, gives us a squared again. So, our formula for the area of a square based on the distance from its center to one of its corners works. Great. But what's the point? Why would I ever use this formula when it's so much more effort? Well, you wouldn't, at least not for a square. But let's consider another case. Take a hexagon. What is the general formula for the area of a hexagon? Do you know? You might, but certainly a large number of people will not know off the top of their heads. If we do what we did last time, we can divide the hexagon into six triangles. The one unique angle of each of these isosceles triangles can be found by considering the fact that the sum of the angles about a point is equal to 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians. Hence, each of these angles is 1 sixth of 2 pi. So, our area for the hexagon is 6 multiplied by a half, multiplied by r squared, multiplied by sine 2 pi over 6. Which, when simplified, becomes 3 root 3 over 2 a squared. In the special case of a regular hexagon, the triangles are all equilateral, so a and r are both interchangeable in the formula. By now, we should be able to spot a pattern. The number of sides, n, is equal to the number of isosceles triangles we can form. The unique angle of each of these isosceles triangles will be 2 pi divided by n. Hence, the general formula for an n-sided regular polygon is a half nr squared sine 2 pi over n. To test if this formula is correct, we can evaluate the limit as n approaches infinity. If we do this, the shape tends to becoming a circle, hence our expression should become the formula for the area of a circle. To evaluate limits, we're going to have to employ everyone's best friend calculus. This limit is not a trivial limit, unfortunately. We can't just plug in n equals infinity to get our answer, for what should be obvious reasons. If we did this, this term evaluates to infinity, and the sine term evaluates to zero. But infinity times zero is nonsense, as we don't know how big the infinity is, or how zero the zero is, as weird as that sounds. These kinds of indeterminate limits call for a trick known as L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule states that if you have two functions like this, and a limit of indeterminate form, such as infinity over infinity, or zero over zero, you can differentiate the function in the numerator and the function in the denominator independently and evaluate the limit again. You can keep doing this until the limit is trivial, and this trivial limit will be the limit of your original undifferentiated functions. Now, the observant amongst the audience will have noticed a little problem with trying to use this trick in our case. 
we don't have a fraction, we have a product. But this is where we can just use a bit of creativity and express the product as a complex fraction, otherwise known as every math teacher's least favourite thing to look at and mark. First, let's pull out the constants. Now, rewriting this as a complex fraction, we can say our expression is equivalent to 1 half r squared multiplied by sine 2 pi over n, all over 1 over n. Now, let's write 1 over n as n to the minus 1 power, so we can finally use L'Hopital's method to evaluate this limit. Rather than narrate each step, I'm going to show you on screen. Feel free to pause and go over each step if you need more time. What we get is a half r squared multiplied by the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 pi cos 2 pi over n. Now we only have 1n, so the limit is straightforward. 2 pi over n will approach 0, and cos 0 is 1. Hence the limit evaluates to the nice, simple expression of a half pi r squared. But wait, that's the formula for an area of a circle, so we have shown our expression is correct. So now we've checked our expression is correct, we can do the even more tedious task of approximating a circle. Notice that the only part of the expression that is not the area of a circle formula is this sine term. Hence, this is our approximation for pi. I know it seems odd to have a term with pi in it when approximating pi, and yes, I can see the problem with that. You could imagine it as 360 degrees if it bothers you, or you could realise this is not that serious and just a bit of fun, and move on with your life. Now, I could and probably should have written a program to do this for me, but I wrote the script at 10pm and really couldn't be bothered, so just sat and played around with my calculator for 20 minutes. Let's say we want pi to a decently high precision, of being correct to 5 decimal points. Good enough for most purposes, really. Well, when n equals 50, our approximate pi is 3.13333330839, which evaluates to 3 to one significant figure. Engineers, feel free to stop watching here. If you're satisfied with pi correct to only 2 dp, then when n equals 56, our pi approximation is 3.13500 so 3.14 correct 2 decimal places. I don't have anything fun to say about the rest of these, I literally just sat and typed numbers into a calculator. The results are on screen. When n equals 1635, our pi approximation is equal to 3.14158492.1. Okay, we're nearly there. When n equals 1638, our pi approximation is equal to 3.14158494.9. Nearly there again. When n is equal to 1644, our pi approximation is equal to 3.14158505, which is 3.14159 to 5 decimal places, which agrees with the first 5 decimal places of pi. If you want to be even more precise, you can write the program and get pi to 10, 20, 100, or however many decimal places you want. But like I said, the engineers were happy to stop at pi is approximately 3 and most others would be happy to stop here. Our value has a percentage error of about minus 2.43 times 10 to the minus 4%, which is very low. If you want a way to visualize this or compare this number of this size, you can consider a probability. As a probability, it is the same order of magnitude of being dealt a royal flush in poker. So, in conclusion, um, I don't really know what the point of all of this was.